turn in my eye. He will be starting soon. Oh, oh, oh. story time with Mr. Lamada. Where all your dreams come true. Oh, oh, oh. He brings to life. Your favorite stories with a great big smile. You won't leave lonely. Won't you start? I'll read them. I just can't wait to be here. Story time with Mr. Lamada. He will be starting soon. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Storytime. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, happy Thursday, wherever you are today. Thank you for being here, and I hope that you do enjoy our story for today. And of course, uh, we enjoy the time that we spend here together. Thank you so much for joining in Story Time. Happy Thursday one more time. And I hope that you are well, you and your loved ones, wishing you the very best for today and, of course, for many more days to come. Thank you so much for joining in today. I am excited for this one. It is um, definitely from um, uh, talking about um, a dark part of American history, but it is still American history. And I think we need to have these conversations. And this book helps us um, dive a little bit into that topic of um, Japanese American incarceration. And this one is called Seen and Unseen. What Dorothea Lange, Toyo Miyatake, and Ansel Adams photographs reveal about the Japanese American incarceration. This one is written by Elizabeth Patridge and illustrations by Lauren Tamaki. Thank you so much for joining in today. And we're reading this one with permission of Chronicle Books of San Francisco, a powerful topic a big, big book today. Thank you so much for joining in. We won't get through it all, but at least we'll try and get through um, uh, quite a bit of it and just um, see what um, what that encourages us to do, what that inspires us to do from today onwards. Thank you so much for joining in, Storytime. Glad you're here. As always, please let us know where you're joining in from and who is joining in with you. Thank you so much. Storytime coming to you from Oakland, California. Thank you so much for being here. It is cold out here. Um, I know that places around um, have even hit uh, 27 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty cold out here. If you're going out, be sure to carry your jacket. Be sure to carry your warm clothing. Thank you so much for being here on Storytime. And um, yes, hopefully this story warms your heart as hard a topic as it is. I hope that it still warms your heart. Thank you so much for joining in. And a big thank you indeed for this wonderful submission. It looks cold, but also looks so pretty. I love it. Um, thank you indeed for the submission um, for this one to you um, out there. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, beautiful Gretchen, Massachusetts, as we see out there. Thank you so much for joining in and i am glad that you are here let us see who is with us this morning ready to enjoy a wonderful story of course good morning to you how are you doing miles and owen good to see you here on storytime live thank you so much for joining in and i hope that you have a wonderful thursday i hope that your day is off to a great start thank you so much for being here with us appreciations all around thank you indeed tara mcnamara good morning to you and of course erin and clara in cold and wet Massachusetts. Thank you so much for being here. Please do stay dry, do stay warm. Thank you indeed for being here with us on Storytime. And I hope that you enjoy the wonderful book that we have today for you. Thank you so much for joining in. Good morning to you. How are you doing? You say happy Thursday, everybody, from Sarah and Nathan out in Chile, Illinois. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, good morning to you as well, Amanda West. Thank you so much for joining us on Story Time. Soraya and of course, Sharon Lungo right here in Oakland. Good morning to you. Thank you for being here on Story Time. Are you ready for today's book, Seen and Unseen? Coming to you very shortly. Shortly. This one written 
by Elizabeth Partridge and illustrations by Lauren Tamaki. Full title, Seen and Unseen, what Dorothea Lange, um, Toyo Miyatake, and Ansel Adams photographs reveal about the Japanese-American incarceration. Yes, three very different perspectives um, and takes on um, with these um, photographs. And uh, I hope that uh, we, we, we learn um, something from this book today. And of course, just so, so that it evokes certain emotions that we can continue to have these conversations where we are. Thank you so much for joining in today, coming up very shortly. And um, also, as you know, Jack the Library Cat is coming to Storytime, May 11th, and of course, with Marietta. So keep an eye out for that one coming to us shortly. Thank you so much for joining in. And I know that it should have been coming out today, March 2nd, but was moved due to um, supply chain issues. Now it is coming a little bit later in the year. Thank you so much for joining in Storytime. And uh, we're going to get ready for a story coming up very shortly. Thank you so much for joining in. Oh, and I do have a special announcement too. If you're able, I know that uh, different time zones um, might not allow, but we will be um, doing a special story time because today is Read Across America Day. So we will be doing a special reading, a special nighttime story. So we're back here at um, around five, um, five uh, Pacific time for a reading of um, a very special book too. Just something to share on this special day that you know, celebrates reading. And that's what we do together, right? So um, look out for uh, that information coming up to you later. It will be on the Storytime platforms and uh, we'll be able to see what book we're reading and of course, what time we'll be here too. If you can join us for a bedtime story, please do. And if not, well, we'll see you again tomorrow because we are back. We still have one more book to come in this week's wonderful lineup. Thank you so much for joining in Storytime and glad that you are here. I'll see you on the other side of this very short message when we are back for more Storytime. Thank you for being here with us on Storytime. <laughs> this is Anika Rose Reese, author of The Teacher's Pet, Watch Out for Wolf, Love Sophia on the Moon, the Anna Banana chapter book series, and Hide and Don't Seek and other very scary stories. And you are watching Storytime with Mr. LaMata. Hello, I'm Olalu Ogunyemi, officer in the United States Marine Corps and author of Crow from the Shadow. You are tuned in with my brother on Storytime with Mr. LaMata. Enjoy and God bless. Welcome back. Thank you indeed. Good morning to you one more time. Yes, if you've not checked out um, Teacher's Pet, do check it out by Anika Mros Risi, a beautiful book indeed. And of course, if you want a scary book as well, um, check out Hide and Don't Seek. I love that one. It is a beautiful one indeed. <laughs> So if you're in for a little scare, read that one. And um, of course, to Ola Olu Ogunyemi, Crow from the Shadow. And of course, he's also given us Billy Dipper's Time to Shine. Check all those out on the Storytime platforms and indeed ask for them at your local library. But today's story, we'll get started and we'll see how much we can get through in the time that we have. This one is by Elizabeth Patridge, illustrations by Lauren Tamaki, and uh, it is called Seen and Unseen. What Dorothea Lange, Toyo Miyatake, and Ansel Adams photographs reveal about the Japanese American incarceration. Yes, a story told through three different lenses, very different lenses indeed. And those are just some of the um, places, as you can see, where the uh, concentration of those uh, incarceration um, camps were, were um, at the time um, where Japanese Americans were incarcerated or imprisoned during World War II. You can see the concentration there on the West Coast as um, the proclamation was. There's something to think about there too. And you can see here it mentions on the key too that some of those were prison camps and the others were detention centers before people were um, then sent to these, um, well, for lack of a better term, more secure locations. Seen and unseen. What Dorothea Lange, Toyo Miyatake, and Ansel, 
Ansel Adams photographs reveal about Japanese American incarceration. This one we're reading with permission of the publishers, Chronicle Books of San Francisco. Find it where you find books, find it at your local library. Early in the morning on December 7th, 1941, Imperial Japan bombed the US Navy base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. like I moved a little too fast on that. I'll hold on that picture for a minute. Hours later in far away Los Angeles, Toyo Miyatake was photographing a fancy wedding. Suddenly, agents for the US government barged in. They arrested several men and took them away. Up and down the West Coast, leaders of the Japanese American community were rounded up and taken away. Bankers, priests, newspaper reporters, even teachers. Where had they been taken and why? Families were given no information. The next day, the United States declared war on Japan. Some Americans were afraid of Japanese military. The Japanese military would attack again, this time on the mainland, where Japanese Americans, where Japanese Americans on, uh, along the West Coast planning to sabotage the United States? Would fishermen signal to Japanese submarines where to creep into US ports? Were farmers sending coded radio messages to the Japanese military from their fields? Rumors flew from person to person, newspaper to newspaper. The US government acted swiftly against all people of Japanese ancestry. Their radios, cameras, and weapons were considered contraband and were confiscated. Bank accounts were frozen so they could not access their own money. Curfews and travel restrictions were set up no one was allowed to go no more than five miles from their home, and everyone had to be back in their houses by 8 p.m. I guess the question we all ask ourselves is, what makes an American? Japanese and Japanese Americans were afraid too. They had the face of the enemy. They needed to show they were not disloyal to the US government. Mothers pulled kimonos from their closet. Fathers took calligraphy off the walls. Books, letters, and photographs from relatives in Japan were hipped in a pile. Everything was burned. Imagine how hard that must have been to give up a part of you. And to burn treasured letters and communication from home. No one knew what would happen to the Ise, the older Japanese, who had immigrated to America but had not been allowed to become citizens? And what about their children, the Nisei, Japanese Americans who were born in the United States and were citizens? What would happen? I don't know what's going to happen to your mother and me, future US Congressman Mineta's Issei father told him and his four siblings. But just remember, all of you are US citizens and this is your home. There is nothing anyone can do to take this away from you. But he was wrong. Oh, 
Du bist... Ja, Mann, jetzt mal... On February 19, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. It authorized the removal of more than 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. The government called it an evacuation. Evacuees would be taken to assembly centers until internment camps were ready. And there you can see. The instructions. The truth, well, it was not an evacuation. Let's be clear about that. People are evacuated from an emergency, like a fire or flood. The evacuation was a forced removal. The few Japanese Americans who didn't comply faced criminal charges. Assembly centers were temporarily, were temporary detention centers with fences and armed guards. Internment or relocation camps were actually prison camps where the Japanese and Japanese Americans were imprisoned for most of World War II. It was a separate system from the US criminal justice system. Evacuees were prisoners. Words can lie or clarify, says Aiko Heads of Yashiriga. Evacuees were prisoners. And that is the truth. And that gets us to Dorothea Lange. How did this photographer happen to take those pictures. Well, Dorothea Lange photographed for the War Relocation Authority. And this happened between March 1942 to July 1942. In San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area, Dorothea Lange was asked to photograph the roundup and forced relocation of all Japanese and Japanese Americans on the West Coast. Officials wanted documentary photos to show it was being carried out in a humane, orderly way. Dorothea was horrified by the government's plan. The prisoners would be held without charges filed against them and without the right to a trial. That was illegal in the United States. But there was a war on, and Japanese Americans' rights were suspended. How is that even possible? Dorothea could have refused, but she was eager to take the job. She wanted her photographs to show what the government was doing was unfair and undemocratic. Day after day, she rose at dawn, photographing in cities and on farms. It was important to show how Japanese Americans were living before they were sent to the temporary detention centers. She pushed herself as hard as she could. As long as there was light to photograph by, she kept going. While Lange photographed, Japanese Americans were making painful decisions. People had only a few weeks to prepare. They had to store their possessions or sell their cars and belongings for a fraction of what they were worth. Families had to give away their pets. Japanese farmers grew nearly half of the fruits and vegetables in California. They were told to keep working right up to the very last day. The government did not want their crops to go to waste. Hmm. One farmer frustrated that he could not get a 24-hour deferral so he could harvest his strawberries before reporting to the detention center, plowed under his entire ripe strawberry crop. The next day, 
the FBI arrested him for committing an act of sabotage. Hmm. Each family was assigned a number. They were no longer known by their name, but instead by a number. It was devastating. And there you can see here the Mochita family waits for the evacuation bus. We were locked, we were looked upon as untrustworthy, disloyal, sneaky, etc., said one young man. And perhaps most of all, not really as someone with an identity, only a number. Families gathered at bus and train stations to be taken to the detention centers. No matter how they felt, they tried to be cooperative and patient to show they were loyal to the United States. They were only allowed to take what they could carry. Can you imagine leaving everything behind, only taking what you can carry, and not even knowing when you would be back or if you would be back? Over 100,000 people were taken from their homes, riding in buses with the windows peppered over, papered over and trains with the shades pulled down. Six-year-old Amy Iwasaki thought that she, her family, and all the Japanese Americans had done something so bad that the people didn't even want to look at us. Hmm. Dorothea was ready with her camera as people arrived at the Tanforan Assembly Center, one of 17 temporary camps located a few miles south of San Francisco. Before the army took it over, it had been a horse racing track. Each family was assigned either a room in a rough barrack or an old horse store and the adjoining storage room. They would have to live in these small rooms while more permanent camps were set up. The stores had been swept out and whitewashed, but they still reeked of horse manure and urine. Imagine that. Everyone was given a large cloth sack and told to fill it from bales of straw. It would be their only mattress. It was terrible, said one man. The government moved the horses out and put us in. The stable stank awfully. I felt miserable, but I couldn't do anything. It was like a prison. Guards on duty all the time, and there was barbed wire all around. Dorothea photographed as the prisoners waited in long lines for meals. For dinner, they were served canned meat, spinach, boiled potatoes, and a piece of bread. Some people found ways to keep their spirits up. Mina Okobo posted a fake quarantine sign for privacy. Families planted gardens. Fly-catching contests were held. They tried. Candidates ran for cancel, for cancel positions. Everyone felt lonely and anxious about the future, said Sadae Takizawa. Deep down, we felt anger. It was a melancholy, a complex feeling. Back home in her studio, Dorothea developed her negatives and printed two photographs from each one. She wrote careful captions, including as much information as she could. She made detailed lists of where she had been, the cost of gas, parking, and bridge tolls. She had to account for every penny she had spent. Then she drove across the Bay Bridge to San Francisco and turned everything 
into Major Beasley at the Army's Western Defense Command. They didn't get along. She didn't like the control over her work. He was suspicious of Dorothea and what her photographs would reveal about the harsh conditions faced by the prisoners. After she left, he inspected every image. He told the secretary to write impounded on the ones he wanted buried in a file for the duration of the war. Some of his choices made no sense, but he had the last word. For example, these two pictures below. So this image was impounded while this one was not. Can you think why? Yeah, just a thought. In June 1942, the prisoners were moved again. Dorothea soon followed the buses full of Japanese and Japanese Americans. Hours passed as she drove the long, desolate California roads to the Manzana War Relocation Center, one of the 10 war relocation authority camps set up by the government, sandwiched between the Sierra Nevada and Inyo Mountains. She wanted to start photographing as soon as she arrived, but she was kept waiting, fuming as her papers and camera were checked and rechecked. Finally, they, were, they let her work, but now the military had a new way to control what she photographed. A guard stuck close to her side, watching her carefully to make sure she obeyed the rules. No photographing the communal showers or bathrooms. No photographing the guard towers with their machine guns and searchlights. No photographing the tall barbed wire fences surrounding the camp. I never dreamed I would see my children behind barbed wire, said one father. You can see here, a dust storm at Manzana. The people tried, stay happy to keep their spirits up. Dorothea wanted to show how hard the Japanese and Japanese Americans worked to make their situation bearable. The tar paper covered barracks were nearly bare inside when the prisoners arrived. They set up sheets for privacy and scrounged scrap lamba to make rough benches and chairs. She photographed farmers clearing sagebrush to start vegetable fields and women scrubbing and cleaning and planting small gardens. Baseball teams were set up and everyone turned out to watch. School classes were started right away, even though there were no tables or chairs. How do you make a prison feel like home? Mm. And we're going to skip ahead from here too, just so you can hear a little bit about... Um, um, I want us to read the next because we've looked at Dorothea Lange, but I also want us to look at Toyo Miyatake just a little bit. And then we're also going to um, we'll see if we'll get to Ansel Adams. But because of time, we're going to uh, rush through. But I hope that, you know, we can bring this book back and also that you can find it at your local library and just get to dive into this book and and um, read a lot more of uh, what is uh, highlighted in this in this uh, book. Very powerful indeed. So Toyo Miyatake. Imprisoned in 1942 to 1945, photographed at Manzana from 1942 to 1945. So you can already see the difference here. Toyo was um, actually imprisoned, whereas um, Dorothea Lange was coming in um, uh, hired to come and photograph, or at least, you know, for propaganda. It was just that Dorothea was very opposed to um, the incarceration camps. And so she really tried to document from a very different angle. But um, so here we go. Toyo Miyatake and his family were family number 9975 at Manzana. They lived in the block 20, building 12, apartment 4. The six of them, along with a cousin, shared one small room. Toyo's oldest son, 18-year-old Archie, could not believe how his life had changed. He had left all his friends and teachers at Roosevelt High School in Los Angeles. Now this is where he would have to live. One day, Toyo called Archie to come inside. I smuggled in. 
I smuggled in my camera lens. He told Archie, showing it to him. And a film holder so that I can take photographs. A friend in the carpentry shop promised to make the body of the camera for you, for him. Archie was shocked. He thought his father was taking a big risk. What if he was caught? But Toyo was determined. I have to record everything, he said to Archie. This kind of thing should never happen again. This kind of thing should never happen again. The lunchbox camera. When no one was watching, Toyo's friend belt the camera body, carefully fitting together small scraps of wood and sending them to a smooth, to a smooth finish. Now Toyo just had to figure out how to get film in his camera. And so he devised a plan. What was that plan? And this is how it looked like. You can see the lunchbox camera. Yeah, I had to hide. Many white Americans worked at the camp and others freely came in and out. Salesmen arrived weekly to take orders for things people wanted to buy and brought them back to the camp the next day. By chance, one salesman was an old friend of Toyo's and agreed to smuggle film and darkroom chemicals into camp. He did it right under the watchful eyes of the authorities. The salesman would hang his coat in the hallway and the Japanese American prisoner who works with the military police would take the supplies from the coat and back, bring it back to Toyo. And there's so much more that we can cover. Like, for example, uh, it gets to a point where Toyo is not even allowed to press um, the the shutter, the, the, the camera, the, to press the button on the camera. He had to, um, there had to be other people to take photographs for him. And you can read all about this and so much more that happens. And then also we can look at the perspective of Ansel Adams and seeing where he was coming from and um, yeah, and the perspective that he was bringing to taking photographs as he tried to um, feel, push the government propaganda as to what the camps really were. But um, we have to stop here for today because of time. Thank you so much for joining in Storytime today. I'll be right back after this break to talk a little bit more about seen and unseen and of course, um, just a little more story time. Thank you so much for joining in story time today. I'll catch you on the other side of this very short message. <laughs> Hi, friends. My name is Christy, and I am the author of A Heart in the Sand, also known as Un Corazón en la Arena. Now, this bilingual book is about tesoros or treasures. And something that I treasure is my friendship with Mr. Lamada. So I have a challenge for you. Share this story time with someone who you treasure and we can all spread the literary love. Thank you so much. Welcome back to story time. Thank you for being here indeed. And um, yes, like I said, this one is a big topic, heavy topic, but one that we have to face head on. We have to talk about and uh, indeed share ideas. And like it says in the book too, that yes, this sort of thing should never happen again, should never be allowed to happen again. Thank you so much for joining in story time and the long-term effects of that people's um, lives that were just, um, um, disrupted and all the pain that it caused and just um yeah just thinking of the so many so many people today that have you know family that were incarcerated and um yeah all that pain that was caused thank you so much for joining in story time today a powerful topic a powerful book seen and unseen i hope that you get a chance to borrow it from your local library get it where you get books and just get to dive in and see there's so much more that we could not bring here to story time in just over half hour that we had thank you so much for joining in story time we are looking at personalities this week that have overcome and have tried to overcome um adversity and uh and you know also just help to create so many different uh different things whether those adversities are personal within or indeed bigger like we were looking at today where it is um 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 
involves the government. It involves ill treatment of people by the government, by the country that they call home, their own homes. Yes. So tomorrow we have another one and we'll bring Guitar Genius. And this is the story of Les Paul. And it is written by my good friend, Kim Tomsich and illustrations by Brett Halquist. So join us for this one. Also coming from Chronicle Books of San Francisco. And let us see a different kind of adversity that Les Paul was overcoming. Thank you so much for joining in Storytime today. Day. absolutely appreciate you thank you thank you for being here thank you for allowing us to dive into these topics together i know that you know um we learn together as we continue to talk about these heavy topics and i appreciate you all thank you for your time thank you for being here absolutely appreciate you good morning to you ten chen how are you doing please let us know where you're joining in from oh my goodness it's just a change in name i know exactly who it is tendai chineva how are how are you doing? <laughs> you got me there for sure. Ten Chin, love it. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you are well down there in LA. Thank you so much for joining us. How do you make a prison feel like home? Pulls my heart. Important book. Really, really, it does. And there's lots of questions like that in there. And even when it just says the truth. Those were incarceration camps. Those were prisons. They were not uh, internment camps or any other name that um, the government tried to placate with. No, these were prisons and um, people's lives were disrupted. People were mistreated. Um, yeah, just because of who who they were, what their ancestry was. And I feel um, that is um, that is terrible, awful indeed. And when you hear of those conditions that people had to endure. And uh, I didn't even get to the part of, you know, when the desert gets cold and um, those accommodations were not meant meant to house people. And um, yeah, so, so much to dive into for sure. How do you make a prison feel like home indeed? Uh, deep question right there. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sharon Lungo and Soraya, appreciate you. Uh, Amanda West, Sarah, Nathan, you say thank you for sharing this incredible, powerful book. We need to focus on this part of history so this never happens again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You know, this is why I love this community, because I think um, just the thoughtfulness that we bring, the humanity that we try to highlight. And thank you so much to everybody, really, for making this space feel welcoming, for making this space an open space where we can have honest conversations about topics like this. Thank you so much for joining in Storytime today. We will not stop to highlight important issues here on Storytime. And please do share. If you see us digressing, going one way, remember to, to remind us to stay the course and um, to bring these important topics and share with our little ones, share with this wonderful community and um, uh, play a small part in making our communities better, making our country better, making our world better. Thank you so much for joining in Storytime. This has been Storytime for today. Much love from me. Lots and lots of hugs to each and every one of you. Special hugs indeed, especially after, look, after looking into a topic like this one today. Thank you for being here on Storytime. And as you know too, because um, this also hits really close to home because our very own Lydia Yamaguchi here at Storytime um, you know, had family that were uh, in the uh, were were in the prison camps, and um, yeah, and it's feel like their history, and they happened a long time ago. No, there are people that we've met that were in those camps. There are people that you know were uh, grandparents to our friends, that are family members to our friends, are family members in our communities. You know, so yeah, this is um, real, and like you say, we need to focus on this part of our history. So this never happens again. Thank you so much for joining in Storytime. I appreciate you all so, so much. I hope that you have a wonderful Thursday and we're back again tomorrow when we'll be talking Guitar Genius, the story of Les Paul. Join me for that one tomorrow. But today we had seen and unseen. Thank you so much for being here. This has been Storytime for today. This has been Storytime for this Thursday morning. Much love from me. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Just can't wait to hear it. 